By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to dive into the world of the Ufton Troll Cup. We're back at the Ufton Troll Cup, the old school magic tournament held in the Netherlands, Leeuwarden. And this is episode number three of that tournament. And I'm really looking forward to show you this match because we've got two absolutely stunning, stunning decks. We've got Richard Veenman, who is actually playing with what he calls a community deck, four years of old school community. And the deck is full of cards that he got, cards that he won at events, uh, you know, cards that he got from raffles. I don't know where he got the cards from. Anyway, there's a beautiful deck picture, so I'm really looking forward to doing the deck deck with you, showing you the deck, and then seeing it in action. I'm really curious to see how the deck actually functions, because it's so random. Anyway, we've got that deck, and then his opponent, David Simons, has also brought a really cool deck to the table. He's playing with Yakmov Demon, one of my favorite creatures, and like his whole deck, it's black, it's white, it's really like artifact themed. There's an All Hallows Eve in there. It's a really cool deck, so I'm looking forward to show you that deck and see it in action as well. Now, before I jump into the deck decks, I would just like to point out first that if you wanna skip this section, if you wanna go straight to the action, it is really easy. All you have to do is check the description below, and there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games, Click on there and that'll take you straight to the actual action. And also in the description below, you can find more information about the Ufton Troll Cup, about the rule set that we're following in this specific tournament. So all that information is there. You just have to check the description below. And if you have any further questions or comments, please feel free to leave them down below in the comment section. Okay, and now we are ready for the deck deck. And I'm going to start with the deck of Richard. Let's take a look at his community deck. And here we see the deck of Richard. So the official title is Four Years Old School Community Deck. And the idea of this deck is he wanted to put all the cards in there that he got from other players, that he got at special events, that he won at tournaments, that he got for his Secret Santa. So all the cards are in here, cards that he just got at random. He also wanted to play with the, his artist proofs, um, you know, so he chose this tournament to do that. And it's really cool because normally I would describe Richard kind of as a Johnny, um, you know, if, if you want to put players into, you know, categories, but I'm sure you're aware of, you've got the um, the Spike, you've got the Johnny, and you've got the Timmy, right? And they say that the Spike is the kind of person who just copies a tier one deck, maybe tweaks it a little bit, but really goes through tournaments to win them with just the best deck in the meta at that time. So that could be uh, a Spike, nothing wrong with that, by the way. And then you've got a Johnny, and a Johnny is kind of a person who takes like a tier one deck or two tier one decks and tries to find some new combination, like try to put, you know, his sauce over a specific archetype, you could say. And I, I think that's something that Richard often does. Like he's made, uh, for example, the deck Robo Geddon, which is a combination of two tier one decks, and he kind of made that into a new tier one deck, because I think it's just a really good deck for the right player, of course. You got to know how to play with it. Um, but yeah. Anyway, that's kind of how I would describe Richard. And then we've got the, the Timmy, my favorite type of player, who just sees magic as, you know, a way to express himself and or herself and just do lots of different stuff and just funny, crazy stuff. Anyway, um, and then, uh, so Richard is usually a Johnny player and now he comes with this really cool, quirky, flavorful deck where he says, you know, this is an homage to my four years here in the old school community. And I think it's really cool that, you, that you've done that. I'm so looking forward to see this deck in action. And what we see here on the left is just hilarious. We see bachelor party presents. So I guess that is exactly what it describes. These are presents he got during his bachelor party. And I'm really happy to see you got a Timmy. It's not for me, but I'm happy to see you got a Timmy for your bachelor party. Um, and then on the, um, on the other side, right next to it, I should say, are the tournament trophies. So cards that he won for specific reasons at specific tournaments. Like I know you've won the um, the Hill Giant uh, Cup. So I do see a Hill Giant there. And I also see a card that I recognize here, that's Ghost Ship. And that's a card that I actually gave you in, was that 2020 already during Christmas? Um, because I handed out uh, Ghost Ships to everybody that supported the channel in some way, mainly to uh, channel members and patrons. 
and it says the text on there it says what shall we do with the drunken sailor it's a really cool altar and they're made by lady deaf dutch so really nice to see that in this deck and then we also see community given cards we see artist proofs i know that richard has started to like artist proofs more and more and i guess he really wanted to play with these uh, sketched artist proofs you see there at the top i think they're absolutely stunning and they're in this deck so that's going to be really nice it's going to be hard sometimes to recognize them while he's playing with them. I do recognize a few, like Battering Ram, for example. Who plays with Battering Ram? <laughs> it's really cool to see a deck that plays with Battering Ram. I'm really excited to see it in action. Um, and then we also see the, the Secret Santa gifts. And then at the bottom of the deck, we kind of see the business side of the deck. Like it's, it's also important, of course, to have, you want your deck to function, right? And this deck has five colors. So that means he needs a mana base to support those ridiculous, like, color, how, how do you say, the color balance of this deck. So that is why we see, um, let me have a look here, of course, Four City of Brasses, we see all the duels, basically, and then we see the, the strictly business business cards, right? And and this is this is what I like when, when you play with power to do ridiculous stuff, I always love that, man. So we see the Black Lotus added as card number 61, that's hilarious. And then um, we also see oh, that horrible black card, Mind Twist. I guess you kind of need those meme cards to to at least have a chance uh, to win. I mean, if you look at that Strictly Business side, it's it's really spiky again, you know. Um, but it makes sense in this deck because you kind of, you need a chance. So I, I, I think Demonic Tutor, for example, is really good in this deck because it allows you to find that specific one good card that can get you kind of out of a bad place. Talking about a card that can do that, that is balance, of course. Balance is, I think, really good in this deck because he's playing with a lot of mediocre creatures. So he can use those creatures to just chump block the the creatures of the opponent and just play the balance at the right time, you know, and, 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 and kind of start all over again, reset the board and, and maybe take advantage out of that. So I think the balance can be definitely a lifesaver here. Um, and yeah, you, you know, we see the, the typical blue power as well, the, the, the time twister, the time walk, we see ancestral recall. So I think that's kind of what the deck needs. If, if I'm looking at the deck as a whole and, you know, what kind of cards I'm looking forward to kind of see hit the board, um, I think it's actually in the sideboard that's the Island Fish Jesconicus. I think it's just such a hilarious card. So I hopefully you're going to board it in. Although you're not playing against an opponent with blue, so you're probably not going to board it in. Um, but yeah, oh, and I'm looking forward to see Raging Bull. And Raging Bull, it is in here. It's one of the artist proofs. It's the one that's uh, tilted horizontally, so kind of that landscape view. Um, it's there. It's like the first card of that row of artist proofs. Um, and it's, you know, uh, Richard, in case you don't know, Richard organizes the Raging Bull series, a really cool tournament that's usually held in Amsterdam when possible or else online. Um, so it's really cool to see Richard, Mr. Raging Bull, actually playing a Raging Bull for a change. So I'm looking forward to Richard. I hope you're going to cast your Raging Bull. I think that's going to be a big moment. Just in case you don't know, Raging Bull is just one red, one two, uh, one red and two for a two two vanilla from Legends. Read the flavor text. It's uh, it, it says a lot about Richard. Anyway, this is <laughs> this is his deck. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, David Simons, and let's take a look at his Yakmov deck. And here is the deck of his opponent today, David Simons, and I've called it Yakmov's Plants. And the reason for that is that the first two cards I really noticed here are the Yak is the Yakmov Demon, both of the demons. Um, it's it's really good. Well, is it a really good creature? It's a strong creature. Let me put it that way. It's two black and four to cast for a summon demon. It's got flying. It's got first strike. So flying first strike is a combination you don't see often. Um, and it has at the beginning of your upkeep, you may sacrifice an artifact. If you don't tap Yakmov Demon, it and it deals two damage to you. Now, what I like about this is that it's a May Claw, so you don't have to sacrifice an artifact. What I don't like about it is that it taps itself. The damage is two damage is fine. I can take that; it doesn't matter. But the fact that it taps itself, that's kind of a problem. I remember, you know, I, I have to think about Lord of the Pit, for example. It doesn't tap itself. It gives you damage, but you can still attack with it. You know, that's a huge different difference. So I'd, I'd rather see Yakmov Demon dealing six damage to me and that I don't have to tap it and I can still attack with it. But I guess when you're playing with Yakmov Demon, your idea is I will always have an artifact to sacrifice. And then look at the Tetravus. Tetravus works great with Yakmov Demon. 
Tetravus, six to cast for a 1-1 one, one flyer that comes into play with three plus one plus one counters. During your upkeep, you can take the counters off for 1-1 one, one Tetravite flying creatures. So basically, it's four creatures in one creature, right? And then you've got four 1-1 one, one flying artifact creatures. You can sack one 1-1 one, one flyer during your upkeep to keep your Yawkmoth demon active, and then you can attack with your demon, right? So those two cards work hand in hand, you know? It's, it's just great to see that synergy and i'm looking forward david to actually see you pulling it off in the games to come so i hope that you can pull it off talking about little tricks in this deck we also see a card called hell's caretaker one black and three to cast and that works together really well with the tetravis because yakmov's um sorry hell's caretaker is a one one creature and during your upkeep you can tap it to sacrifice one of your creatures on the board and then you can get a creature back from your graveyard directly onto the battlefield so if you've got like your 1-1 Tetravis Tetravite token, you can sacrifice your token and then you can get a really nice big creature from your bin back, you know, for example, your Guardian Beast or maybe another Tetravis. If you get back another Tetravis, you can make even more creatures. So you have this little creature making cycle going on. It would be really cool to see that in action. I think a huge downside of Hell's Caretaker is, and I love this creature, but a huge downside is you can only use his ability during the upkeep. I wish you could just use it whenever. Maybe that would make it too strong, but I wish it wouldn't just be the upkeep, you know, or at least do it in your turn, that you can only use it in your turn or something, but make it a little bit more flexible. Anyway, that's Hell's Caretaker. Um, talking about getting things back from your bin, we also see our Givian Archaeologist, just a beautiful card, two white and one to cast, two white and tap to use. And when you use it, you can bring back any artifact from your graveyard to your hand. And I just love the flavor. He's an archaeologist, right? So he's going to dig up treasure for you. I mean, it just makes sense. And I, I, I love that about the card. I love cards that make sense. For me, that's also kind of old school. When you look at a card and you think, I think it does that. And you're like, oh, I'm right. It actually does do that. I love it. You know, art, name, ability, it all makes sense. Anyway, um, another really strong card in this deck as well is Guardian Beast. Guardian Beast, one black and three for a two, four. And as long as it untapped, all your non-creature artifacts are indestructible. So this card is really huge. And I guess it can be really strong. What if Simon manages to get a Chaos Orb on the board and a Guardian Beast on the board at the same time? You know, then you've got like an invincible uh, Chaos Orb. He can just keep flipping it over and over and over again. It does come back into play tap though after the flip. So you have to wait another turn to untap and flip again. But still, it's ridiculously powerful. Um, talking about, you know, getting things out of the graveyard and stuff. He's also playing with Jalum Tome, which I think could work really well in this deck. Jalum Tome, I also call it the little uh, book because you've got Jam Day Tome, which is the big book. And Jalum Tome is the little book. And what it does, three to cast, two and tap. And um, you it lets you draw a card, but then you immediately have to discard a card, right? And so you can use your Jalum Tome to draw into a card, but also to get the right cards in your bin. So for example, when you've got Hell's Caretaker on the battlefield, you probably want to have a Tetravis in the bin so you can, you know, get the Tetravis back directly into play with your Hell's Caretaker. So there are a few, you know, tricks. Also, Anime Dead is in this deck, works really well with the Jalum Tome as well. Okay, so this is the deck of David. We also looked at the deck of Richard. Two really, really cool decks. Thank you, gentlemen, both for bringing these epic decks already for me epic to the table let's hope that we get a really exciting like match that does justice to these decks i guess there's only one way to find out if that's really going to happen so let's go to the games game number one is about to start and on the right side we have richard with his community deck and on the left side we have david and he's on the play it seems with his black and white yakmov deck there we see a Bayou into a Lanara Elves, a great turn one here for Richard. There is a quick response by David, sorts to Plowshare, so that Lanara is a goner. And we see Richard tick up to 21 life. Let's see what can David do, we're playing a basic Swamp passing turn. There we see a Savannah and a pass. And does David have a turn one or turn three play, I should say? Maybe a Jalen Tome here? Nope, just passing turn. And there's a Volcanic Island and he's tapping his islands, all his lands, I should say. And there it is, really cool card. This is Raging Bull. So the 2-2 Vanilla from Legends. And it's an artist proof with art made by the artist himself. It's really cool art. I believe it shows like a Dutch landscape with the bull kind of going right through it. 
It's really cool art. And I, he also had, but I think you gave it away as a price, right? That he shared, you also had a raging bull with art of the bull like running loose through Amsterdam. It was really beautiful. And uh, he's passing turn here to David. Let's see what he can do. Playing out a city of brass. And ooh, still not playing out anything. So I wonder what's in that hand. Maybe just a lot of tetravuses or just expensive creatures. There's another duel tapping everything he has. Are we gonna see a hill giant here? No, we're gonna see a primal clay. So primal clay is a really cool creature from antiquities. You can choose to make it a 3-3 three, three creature, a 2-2 two, two flyer, or a 1-5 wall, or was the 1-6 wall? Anyway, there's a disenchant here by David, killing the creature straight away. He did, he did take two damage though from the Raging Bull. There we see a Library of Alexandria, but he doesn't have a lot of cards in hand. And still no creatures here or artifacts from David. There's another attack for two, so he's gonna drop to 16. Then in the second main, I guess, we're gonna see some more action. There is a Timmy, a prodigal sorcerer, so a 1-1 one, one creature, and he can tap it to deal one damage to any target. So now he's got six mana. I'm expecting a Tetravis here. Taking a damage from his own city of brass. There we see a Tetravis. So this is a 4-4 four, four flyer with three plus one plus one counters on it. And now Richard is going to untap. And of course now that Timmy is kind of good in this scenario because it's going to be really difficult for David to kind of take off the counters. And he's actually going to flip on it straight away with his Chaos Orb. He's going to use his own Tim as a target. Let's see if he hits. And yep, that is a hit. So that means it's the end of the road for the Tetravis. And he's attacking again with the Raging Bull. The Raging Bull has now hit David for six damage in total. That's pretty impressive. And he's on 13. And let's see if David can play out another Tetravis. Remember, he plays with a full playset. He's playing an anime dead. Okay, that's kind of the same thing. So anime dead getting back to Tetravis and passing turns. So that kind of means that for now, Richard will be unable to attack. He does ping with one, pointing at his Timmy. So that means David's gonna drop to 12. And okay, there we see a Sitinal Druid. So Sitinal Druid, again, this is an artist proof. Sitinal Druid is a 2-2. And every time that David plays an artifact, he gets a plus one, plus one counter on the Sitinal Druid. So it gets bigger the more artifacts that are in there. And uh, I guess he's showing the card now, but we can't see it. It's, it's not on the camera. But uh, yeah, Sentinel drew it from the Antiquities expansion. Beautiful artist proof. For now, it's still pretty small. And I wonder what David is going to do. He's probably not going to take off any 1-1 one -one flyers because the Timmy can just kill those. And I mean, if he attacks, he's on 12. He's going to take more damage. So I think it's just on blocking duty. Unless, of course, he's got another creature. Maybe he's got a Yakmov Demon in hand and he's like, I really want to play out my Demon, but I don't want to take off the, the, the tokens because then they get, can get killed by the Timmy. I think if you're David, you really want to get rid of the Timmy right now. It looks like he's a little bit in the tank here, staring at his cards. He's like, what can I do? Tapping three. And okay, there's a Jalem Tome. That means a counter on the Sentinel, so it, it, it gets stronger. Remember, remember, he can use the Jalum Tome for two and tap to draw a card, then he has to discard a card. He's taking a, another damage from the Timmy, gonna drop to 11. And the Sentinel Druid is actually a 1-1 one, one creature, not a 2-2 two, two creature, like I said earlier, so it's a 1-1. One, one, and it just got a counter, so it's now a 2-2. Two, two. And let's see Richard tapping here, tapping two. There's a Stone Rain on the Library of Alexandria. I don't think David minds too much. I'm a little bit surprised here that he's not using the Jalem Tome. I wonder what he has in hand that he wants to keep it so badly. Because he had the mana open to use the Jalem Tome here. 
And he basically needs just another Tetravist, right? Then he's got one Tetravist on blocking duty and one Tetravist to attack with. That would be ideal for him. And there is a sinkhole. Taking care of one of the dual lands on the side of Richard. But of course, Sinkle kind of loses its power land removal the longer a game takes. Yeah, I think this is a big step. Sorts to Plowshares on the Timmy. Because that means that next turn he can start taking off this little 1-1 Flyers. That's mean another life for Richard, who's on 22. He's got a lot. And look at the life total of David. It's cut in half. He's on 10. If you're Richard, you really want to get rid of that flyer there. If he can get rid of the flyer, it's open and he can swing in for 4 damage, which would be huge. Because David's on 10 already. Only 2 cards in hand and there's a pass turn. So both players kind of stuck. And I'm a little bit surprised that David is not taking off a 1-1 flyer here, because at least he could use that flyer to attack with, and he would still have a 2-3 blocker. He is using the Jalum Tome now for the first time, discarding a City of Brass. And there is an attack. He's just going to attack with everything. Maybe he has a Giant Grove in hand. Remember, he does have a Giant Grove. And he blocks the Sentinel Druid. Sentinel Druid dies, and there we see a Bolt. That's, of course, another way to get rid of the uh, of the Flyer of the Tetravus here. And two damage, of course, dealt again by the, uh, the Raging Bull. It's so cool to see Raging Bull do so much work in a game. I think the Raging Bull has now dealt eight damage. There we see a Jalum Tome activation. And David's on eight already, you know, so he's on a four-turn clock. Okay, there is at least a potential blocker with a Mishra's Factory. Attacking with the Factory, probably going to take the damage still. Going to go down to 6. Wow, he's so low already. There is a Demonic Tutor. Ooh. I wonder what he's going to tutor for. Does he, I, I'm trying to remember now. Does he have a Fireball in his deck? I think. I'm not sure. Okay, of course he's going to tutor for the Ancestral Recall. Probably when you're David and you're playing against this deck, you're like, what is this deck about? I don't understand. I'm seeing these really strong cards combined with these really goofy cards, like Sentinel Druid, Raging Bull, you know, Primal Clay. What's up with that? And then you see these really strong cards like Chaos Orb, Demonic Tutor, Ancestral Recall, all these dual lands. So he's playing out his Ancestral Recall here, finding three more cards. It's looking really good for Richard, actually. I mean, he only has to deal six more points of damage. Playing out a Tundra here. Three cards in hand, I believe, or four cards even, and passing turn. And using the Jalen Tome again, trying to find something useful here, discarding another land. Maybe his hand is just full of lands. I mean, that's definitely an option. Three cards in hand, it seems, or two cards. Kind of hard to see. I believe there are two cards in hand. There we see a Badlands attack here. It's probably going to animate, pump and block. There is the Giant Grove. Ho, 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 ho. That means the factory is a goner. This Raging Bull has got some cojones. You know, it just keeps attacking, attacking, attacking. Is Raging Bull going to win the game here for Richard? That would be just insane. David tapping more, using the Jalum Tome again. Is he going to discard even more land? It kind of seems like he's been on a huge land pocket for most of the game. There we see a Felwer Stone. And playing a Soul Ring. Untapping the Raging Bull. Attacking again. Look at that. More damage dealt by the Raging Bull. He's going to drop to four. There's an often troll at the often troll cup. That's flavor for you. Two, two, one red to regenerate. I mean, it's looking really dire for David here. Using his Jalum Tome again, throwing away one of the other books that he had in hand, apparently. 
playing a Felwer Stone. Oh, he's really not finding the right cards here. He already wants to say, you've got this one. Attacking here. That's it. Two disenchants in hand? Oh, even more lands. Oh, man. Very, very unlucky for David here. But how cool it is to see Richard dealing so much damage with his beautiful Raging Bull Artist Proof. Fantastic to see. Game number one here for Richard. But, of course, it's a best of three. So both these players are going to go sideboard. And we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So Richard is one game up. And uh, there we see David playing a Scrubland passing turn. So no first turn place for him, no first turn place for Richard either, just a Badlands and a pass. There is a Swamp and a pass. A tropical Island. And if you're wondering what those green cards are, they're actually your cards that you can order drinks on so I guess these players are going to order a beer here <laughs> it was held in a really nice venue um, I believe it was called the Cots House in Leeuwarden really nice hotel and restaurant and uh, here we see this shirt oh playing a time walk here taking that extra turn so that means he's gonna get at least a land drop ahead of David here playing a Bayou can he play a Raging Bull? That's the big question. I guess he can't passing turn here to David. Let's see if David can do something. We haven't seen much action from him, from him yet. And again, he just passed his turn playing out a basic planes and pass. So no Jalum Tome, no Felwer Stones, nothing from him yet. And here we're gonna see some action from Richard playing a Chaos Orb. And I guess he's not gonna flip on the lands here. Why would he? There's no need for him to do that. And David playing out another Scrubland and passing turn. I wonder if David has like a disenchant in hand because then you want to keep two mana open so that when you play something out and you know Richard wants to activate his Chaos Orb to destroy it, in response David has two mana open to play a disenchant. So that kind of could explain why he's not casting anything yet. So let's see what he can do here. He's got six lands now. Looks like he's finally going to play out something. Tapping four. There we see. Casting an Icy Manipulator. And you see those two lands open? I think he's keeping the mana open for a Disenchant here. I wonder if Richard's going to flip on the Icy just to test it out. Or maybe he's just going to wait for the right opportunity to do so. Mm, looks like he's playing a, a Lightning Bolt in the end step. That is interesting. So that means David is going to drop to 17. And he's going to tap. Ooh, he's going to play a regrowth on the time walk. Then the question is, is he going to cash in on the time walk straight away? Or does he want to keep it for later in the game? I mean, I've seen time walk decide, decide matches, but you do need um, to wait for the right moment. There we see him tap two. It looks like he's going to cast the time walk here. So he's casting the time walk, so he's going to take an extra turn after this turn. And... Oh, what's he going to do now? Taking a damage. Going to drop to 19. Going to cast a Wheel of Fortune. And there we see the response. I'm expecting a dis... Yeah, there's the disenchant from David taking care of the Chaos Orb. Great timing as well because the Chaos Orb... Um, yeah, uh, oh, look at that balance goes to the bin. But what I wanted to say, great timing because Richard was tapped out as well. So he couldn't use his Chaos Orb in response to the Disenchant. But remember, um, Richard still has his Time Walk turn after this one. So it just, it's such a great combination having Time Walk and Wheel of Fortune in your hand. It's so good. There we see a Black Lotus. What is he going to do now? He can just take on his extra turn, untap all his lands. And it looks like he's passing. I'm, I think something's going wrong here. Maybe I missed something. Let me know in the comments below. But I think that Richard forgot about his extra turn. I mean, Richard, I think you still have to take your time walk turn. But anyway, you've passed the turn, I guess. And Daffit has untapped. I mean, in that case, it must look really, really good for David. I mean, he's got to have a Tetravis or at least something to play out, right? He's 
Gunny Cat plays six. Yeah, there we see the Tetravis, so the 4-4 four, four flyer. And uh, he's gonna get some counters. Got a nice dice there. So there's the 4-4 four, four passing turn. I'm still a little bit surprised that Richard didn't take his extra time walk turn. Maybe I missed something. Anyway, uh, let's just continue with the game as is. There we see a Taiga. There's a tap of the volcanic island. There's an unsummon. Okay, that is so interesting. And he's gonna take a damage from his own city of brass, I guess. Counting the mana, what is he gonna do? With this deck, you just don't know. There's a Mahamoti Jin, sweet! 5-6 flying powerhouse, but of course, David has that icy manipulator with the Mahamoti's name written all over it. Exactly, he's gonna use it straight away, tapping down the Mahamoti. And he's, oh, he's not tapping down the Mahamoti, he's tapping down the land. That's actually better, because the Mahamoti, I mean, doesn't matter if it's tapped. So that's actually a good decision. Could have tapped the Black Lotus as well. I guess that would have been even better. Or does he want to maybe force him to use his Black Lotus? There we see a Terror on the Mahamoti Jin. So things are looking really good for David right now. He actually has mana enough to also cast the Tetravis again. I guess, I mean, why wouldn't you do that? I think he's going to do that, right? No, he's not. He's playing out of Felwer Stone instead. Interesting. And passing turn here. Interesting choice. And it looks like he wants to tap Snow. He's got more tricks up his sleeve. Tapping the Felwer Stone and a Black Mana. And playing a Chaos Orb. Okay, so he's still doing that in his second main phase. And then he's passing turn. Okay, so we see Richard here untapping everything he has. And then we're gonna see him tap down the City of Brass. Of course, that makes sense, David, because he then can deal the damage to Richard. So he's gonna drop to 17. Both players on 17 at the moment in game number two. And Richard is one game up. There we see him tap. Oh, the mind twist. That's so dirty. That's so dirty. Look at his hand. Of course, we saw the Tetravis. We also see a Swords to Plowshares. I believe there was a Demonic Tutor in there as well, although I couldn't see it. But all those cards are now gone. And at least David still played out his Chaos Orb, so he's got the Chaos Orb. It's not too bad, but I mean, it's always a blow having a mind twist against you. And remember, he is playing black and white, so he doesn't really have a lot of card draw in his in his deck. Tapping down the City of Brass again. I mean, if he could like draw into an All Hallows Eve, although then of course Richard will get his Mahamoti back. But there are two Tetravuses in, in, in the bin, so it would be quite nice for him. Tapping three Dark Ritual? What is he gonna do? Play a huge Brain Geyser, perhaps? Wow, this is gonna be big, whatever it is. I'm expecting Brain Geyser. Counting up the mana. Yeah, Brain Geyser. Crazy stuff. I mean, Richard is really finding the business part of his deck and that is really helping him here in this match. Look at the amount of cards that he's drawing. Is he gonna... Three, four, five, six, seven. I think he draws seven cards, right? Because he had the Dark Ritual. Seven extra cards drawn, that's insane. He probably will have to discard a couple or is he gonna sack the Lotus? We see him here, sack the Lotus for three. Tapping the Tropical Island. Are we gonna see a Primal Clay here? Keeping the Trop untapped. So three mana in the mana pool. Playing an often troll on the often troll cup. Going for the flavor. He doesn't have to discard. Wow. It surprises me a little bit. 
there is a maze of if by David. So, I mean, David has his defenses up. The problem, of course, for him is that he only has one card in hand. Oh, to make matters worse, Ancestral Recall. Wow, he's really on the card advantage train here. And that's, of course, the power for, uh, for the color blue here. And all that David can really do is just ping the shirt for one by tapping down the City of Brass. I think that's a good strategy right now. It's basically all that he can do. He's got the maze of it for the often trolls, so that doesn't really matter much. I'm just expecting more creatures now from, um, from Richard, just a lot of random creatures. Energy Flux, oh, that's so annoying for David. And Richard's gonna tap even more. But this Flux is a huge problem. It means that David will have to pay six mana next turn to keep all his artifacts alive and kicking. Maybe he's going to choose, David's going to choose to use his Chaos Orb on the Energy Flux. Do you really want to? We see two more creatures by Richard, by the way. The Lanoer Elves. We do see a Disenchant. Okay, that's good. Disenchant on the Energy Flux. That's good news for David. Um, we see a Lanoer Elves and a Protocol Sorcerer coming from uh, Richard here. So that means Richard can start pinging as well. Very interesting second game thus far. Tapping three, there we see a Jalum Tome. Okay, that can be pretty good because whenever David top decks a card he doesn't like, he can just use the Tome to scry basically, right? Get rid of the card and get a new one in, um, in return. And he's actually gonna flip on the Timmy, interesting. So he's like, I don't want to take the pings from the Tim. And I mean, you have to understand, Tim is really good against David's deck because David really wants to use his Tetravuses and he wants to take the counters from the Tetravus off to make 1-1 flyers. He also plays with Argivian Archaeologist, which is a 1-1. He plays with Hell's Caretaker, which is a 1-1. So there is something to say to kind of go for the Timmy here. And there's one damage here taken from the Lanora Elves. And second main phase here of Richard. And he's gonna play out the pirate ship. Sorry, the ghost ship, of course. Not the pirate ship, the ghost ship. 2-4 flyer from the dark. And we also see an icy manipulator from his side. Ooh, and that icy is gonna be so annoying. That's gonna be so annoying for David here. So all of a sudden the pressure is real. Remember, Richard can use his Icy to tap down the Icy of David in the end step of David. And he can also use it, of course, to tap down the Maze of If. There we see David using the Jalum Tome. Getting rid of the Loa, of course. It's pretty useless right now. So little cards in hand. But it's not looking good. Okay, at least the second Maze. It's looking slightly better for David here. And it's, it's going to be really tough. And we see him actually use the City of Brass to tap down the Icy of David here. So Richard is going to drop to 13. And I'm just expecting an attack, all out attack. The thing is though that, um, you know, David is double maze. So if he attacks with all three creatures, only one creature can, can get through. That's probably going to be the Lanora Elf. So that means only one damage for David. So he would drop to 15. There is another Bayou, a tap here. Oh, he's actually gonna go for the more aggressive route, tapping down a Maze of If, attacking with everything he has. I'm expecting him to send back, maybe the Often Troll, I guess, taking three damage, exactly. Taking three, gonna go down to 13. I wonder if Richard has something against, no, he's just passing turn here. I wanted to say against that Icy Manipulator. One card in hand. Does he want to keep it? Or no, he's going to use the Jalem or not. Oh, he's playing an anime dead. That is good news. Is he going to get back the Mahamoti Jin? Which is now a 4-6 because you get minus 1, minus 0 from the anime. But this is really good news. Although, of course, you know, Richard still has his Icy Manipulator. Wow, and this is this is a long game. I mean, both players are really good at getting their defenses up. 
I'm a little bit surprised that David wants to tap down the City of Brass here. I really expected him to kind of keep his IC untapped and then at the end step of Richard tap down the IC of Richard. Because you kind of want to control that IC game. And now I wonder what Richard is going to do. Is he going to use his IC to, for example, tap down the, um, the Ma Moti Jin? First, it looks like he's going to do something else first. Tapping four. Okay, there's a Hill Giant. 3-3 three, three Vanilla. Really cool to see these creatures on a board here at a tournament. And there is a pass turn. And I mean, things things are looking up right now for David because, I mean, he can attack with the Mahamoti, then untap it with the Maze of If. But I'm saying it at the same time, I'm realizing that Richard has the Ghost Ship and Ghost Ship has three blue regenerate. So he can just use his blue mana to, you know, block with the Ghost Ship, regenerate the Ghost Ship. I wonder if... David is going to try to swing in, but then again, he can... Yeah, so he wants to go to combat. In response, Richard is tapping down his Mahamoti. I mean, it's it's a difficult situation, you know, when both players have an IC, so many creatures on the board, the mazes of if, it can get complicated very quickly. And I think this is a good decision from David not to tap down the City of Brass anymore, but just keep that IC open. And look at that, he's going to use it very aggressively to tap down a Maze of If. And then of course in response, David can use his IC to tap down one of the creatures. Probably going to tap down the Ghost Ship. And Or not. Okay, so he tapped down the Hill Giant. Interesting, I was thinking he could send back the Hill Giant, tap down the Ghost Ship. That way he has uh, the air open to, if he wants to, attack with his Mahamoti. Ooh, what card is this? A Fireball, it seems. Is that Fireball big enough to kill him off? Really? Okay, I need I need to see that play again. Is that Fireball really big enough to kill David here? Let's take a look. Okay, so after that attack, David is on 10. So let's see if he's got enough mana. So tapping 3, 6... 8, 10, 12, 1, 2, yeah, he's got more than enough mana, okay, <laughs> it's crazy, crazy to see him win two games in a row with this community deck, yeah, Fireball can finish a game, that's that's that, and um, wow, really interesting game, really nice to see your deck, uh, Risha, the community deck, also nice to see your deck, David, although, I, you know, I feel it didn't really get his moment in the spotlight, I think your deck can do much, much better than what we've seen, but really cool that you've brought this deck this type of deck to the table. I love seeing cards like Yakmov Demon, Argivian Archaeologist, Hell's Caretaker. Those are just really great cards that see very little play. So it's always nice to see them in action at an old school magic tournament. Um, please um, share your opinions in the comments below. What do you think about both of these decks? What would you maybe improve? Let me know in the comments below. And uh, for now, I would like to thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks. And if you're new to the channel, welcome. Thank you for finding us. Please consider subscribing and ring that bell. And if you're a regular, welcome back. Uh, if you want to help the channel out, you can do that very simply by three simple steps. You can leave a like, leave a comment, and of course, share this on your socials. All that really helps and it is completely free of charge. So you're just helping the channel. Uh, the, there's one last thing that you can do is you can also become a patron of the channel by joining the Timmy Talks Patreon program and that already starts with one dollar and the cool thing is when you join the Patreon program your name will be in the end scroll at the end of every episode. Really? Yes, really. As a matter of fact, we're gonna look at the end scroll right now. Let's take a look at all the amazing, fantastic, wunderbar patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Let's take a look.
Ikitus, Ikitus, Somba, Kazi.